Hi, I'm Bob Ethington. And I'm Nick Nicholas. And this is From Akron and Beyond. Our show, uh, our episode, I should say, uh, this time, we have a couple of very special guests in. We're going to be talking about public art in uh, the Akron area, but kind of what is entailed with that, uh, commissions, um, how how artists come about uh, doing the work and, and uh, their inspirations. And uh, we have a couple of uh, terrific guests here. One is Scott Phillips. He's Operation operations officer uh, at uh, the Maslin Museum. And uh, our other guest is Alex Nicholas Kuhn. She's the executive director at the Maslin Museum. And how we got Alex here, I have no idea. Uh, Nick, how did we possibly be able to get such a fantastic guest? Uh, I guess a little bit of old school nepotism. <laughs> my daughter, my, <laughs> okay. my oldest child that I'm so proud of. Well, welcome to both of you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Mm -hmm. I've been wanting to have you on the show for you know so long, Scott. But what really, Not uh, me. huh? Oh, hell, you, you know, Sorry. you're always around. You know, <laughs> no, uh, Scott. Tender I, moment, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Nick and Alex. <laughs> Scott, I was, uh, you know, been fascinated by your your mural work, your installations over these last probably 15 years that I've known you, but. Uh, you had a home run with a recent uh, uh, civic theater installation, you know, that everybody's talking about. You know, people can't miss it driving by. And, you know, that that, that just sort of, say, hey, man, I got to get Scott on the show. <laughs> oh, thank you, Nick. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I um, uh, moved up to Akron a while ago, and um, I've always wanted to do a big piece of art publicly in Akron. And this is a really good opportunity. There's an open call for that. Um, and working with Pam Fine and Howard over at the Civic has just been, you know, it was an awesome experience. Um, I couldn't have been happier with how it came out, the whole process through the project. Um, they were super gracious, and I love driving downtown every day and seeing that. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool to see your artwork, you know, and the, the thousands of people pass by daily, you know? Yeah, it's cool. And yeah. it's uh, um, that photo is actually you know, probably not more than a stone's throw away from, you know, where that was taken is where that's installed. So that's an actual downtown Akron Canal photo. So I was really happy about that as well. Now, when you say there was an open call, how does that work? Yeah. So with that project, um, they just put out a call. I forget honestly where I saw it. I think I saw it through Arts Now. Nicole Mullet, uh, she's also amazing. She's the one who connected me with my studio space. But um, I think I saw that posted on social media that they were going to do a call. Um, it was in conjunction, I believe, with their capital campaign for their project expansion, mm -hmm. for the building expansion. Uh, they did that beautiful deck with PNC um, out there. Um, so it was a process. I mean, it probably took from uh, me applying till it was installed two years because um, through the pandemic, yeah, you know, yeah. that really slowed everything down. But um, it was difficult. Um, there was a lot of paperwork. There was a lot of designing. Um, I really worked at it because I was like, this is a great opportunity. This is on South Main Street. So yeah, busted my butt. <laughs> yeah, I know that was a heck of a process. You know, I was uh, on the board of the Civic at the time when, you know, the capital campaign that you mentioned, and we were so gratefully you know we're honored by all the you know the participation in that you met our goal uh, sooner than we thought you know <laughs> um. i that's one thing too is you know working at the Maslin museum i love it it's, it's my passion and uh it's such a flexible organization too um hires the whole person there's a lot of artists on staff um so they're um very accommodating when it comes to outside projects but i'm very um particular on um when and how things have to happen because you know when you're you know got 10 pounds a thing in a five pound bag you know <laughs> you got to make sure you schedule all those out accordingly so yeah my priority was getting that done for them them being happy and just you know having a good final product an art project like this is i'm going to show my ignorance here won't be the first or last time <laughs> but um is there certain if when you're doing public art like this? Is there almost like a construction aspect to it in a way? 
Yeah, you're you're kind of like a contractor. I mean, you really are. Yeah, I mean, you're being contracted as a contractor. Mm-hmm. I've taken courses, OSHA courses. You know, really? I, I have. I'm certified with certain equipment and lifts and all that sort of thing because it, it's it's can be dangerous work. Um, the Joe Walsh mural that I did um, at downtown Kent at the Water Street Tavern. Um, wow. That uh, if you know the Water Street Tavern, mm-hmm. there's that weird little alley that goes down next to it, underneath the mural. Mm-hmm. We had to set up the scaffolding, um, and it was a crooked alleyway. So, the, uh, Metis, I believe, they were the construction company that donated that. Um, but to know the logistics on how to set that up, how to actually climb that, how to harness yourself in. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. Yeah. Harness yourself in. Oh, I because that was <laughs> that one. I was up twenty. 20 some feet so yeah usually it entails me tying myself off to some something <laughs> i remember you texting me throughout that project with selfies to show how high he had to be and how steep that incline was and how to navigate placement of a lift for yeah. certain parts of the mural can be really precarious so yeah and i'm did a beautiful sc- job Thank you. I'm scared of heights too, so that's that's a thing. <laughs> I was so. going to say I'd be out oh. bad before it ever began. Yeah, it's kind of one of those things that <laughs> when it first starts, the first three four days of a project, I'm sweating the whole time. I go home and I'm just drenched. Mm-hmm. But then after a couple of days, you get used to it, and I really start getting dialed into the wall itself. I don't even see the height then. Go up on the lift. I'm looking at the wall, and that all kind of goes away. So. I, I saw an Instagram at one point where. Uh, your wife Sandy, who's a, also a well-known local artist, was ha- actually helping you a little bit on the civic. Oh part. yeah, yep, absolutely. Yeah, she did. Um, uh, my friends Joshua Hum and Aaron Meyer. Um, Aaron Meyer's been my lead assistant for, gosh, it's been like ten, twelve years now. So I do have a group of of helpers, including my wife. Mm-hmm. She's kind of the built-in one as far <laughs> as that goes. And uh, we just recently had twins uh, about eighteen months ago now. And mm, congrats! I, thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> how, um, how old are they now? Uh, almost eighteen months. Ah. So. Um, I bring that up because I'm very excited for them to be painting age. So I'm going to have a, a couple more uh, assistants. <laughs> That's great, man. Yeah, Sandy's a great artist. I've seen some of her work uh, over the years. And she's got a great representation of her work at the Bounce Innovation Hub, yep. also in and downtown currently, Akron. Mm-hmm. Currently? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a permanent installation. Oh. They did pillars. They did like this pillar project where if you go into the atrium of the Bounce Hub, um, she did the ones that's a uh, World War II uh, women in factories building airplanes. Yeah, the really? Rosies. Mm-hmm, the Rosies. It's awesome. Yeah, she's an incredible artist. Um, she's a great illustrator. She does children's books as well. So um, really been pushing her to get her stuff out there more. Um, it, having twins now, I see children's books all the time, and I'm always like, Sandy, look at these books. you got to do this. I mean, your mm-hmm. stuff is so strong. So. Mm-hmm. So, Scott, let's go way back. Yeah. Like, do you remember what art first touched you? Like, 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 what did you respond to? When did you start thinking, this is something I'd like to do? Um, Even just I, informally yeah, or yeah, ultimately absolutely. professionally? I, I, think, I think there's two different aspects. Um, growing up, my, my parents were always big into music. So um, oh. music's always been a big part of my life. Um, they were into heavy metal, 80s music. Uh. <laughs> uh, so, you know, Judas Priest, um, that sort of stuff. Judas Priest is actually one of my favorite bands still. I listened to that all the time when I was a kid. Um, but you have your music when I was <laughs> younger. Um, but honestly, my my parents both worked full time, um, and I spent a lot of time with my grandmother mm-hmm. um, and grandfather, um, and didn't have a lot. So whenever I was playing, and this is when I'm real little, my yeah. parents are both full time. Um, she would give me a pile of paper and some markers and mm-hmm. scissors and tape, and say, you know, if you want to play some play with something you know make something you know create something so from an early age i mean i had toys every kid has toys but she did put a big emphasis um my grandmother jackie on creating um and i think that i brought that to my whole kind of 
process in my life that, you know, you don't just need to be provided a toy. You can kind of create that for yourself. So she has all these little things that I cut out or these little um, things that I created, these drawings. She still has some in this in this box at her house. And it's, it's amazing. But, <gasps> yeah, that was something that um, – you know, I was with her so often when I was younger that I really think a lot of my creativity comes from her. Um, she had done most of the the banners at the church, St. Jacob's Lutheran Church, that she was a part of mm-hmm. for the longest time. So a big creative part of me definitely comes from my grandmother. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, for people who know your work or for people who don't know your work, a lot of what characterizes your murals are the dots as we affectionately call them which is (laughs) rooted in that screen printing tradition and i remember the first time i saw you transition to the dots and they were sort of larger less precise dots and over the years you've tightened and tightened and tightened that up and made them smaller and you've been more meticulous in your application of painting those and i had the pleasure of helping you paint some of the 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 tommy henrick mural in downtown maslin and um my role was not painting precise dots it was uh, (laughs) painting some of the more globular i don't know if that's a word shaped dots so i wondered if you could tell us also a little bit about that transition from whatever other style of painting you were engaged in and yeah and some mixed media work you i haven't seen you paint on canvas for a long time but i remember your transition from canvas to wood and then canvas to wall yeah you, you know when i commissioned you a few years ago to do that table for for my wife jennifer and it was uh the silent film star mm-hmm. the Claire do- yeah, yeah. The, the dots are there right mm-hmm. oh yeah that was one of the yeah. furniture dots i think that came out of i think as alex mentioned as a transition i think it was finding yourself you know what i mean but as transitioning into you know the dots. Alex has, I believe, the first piece. It's a it's I a sure dresser do. that has Clarabo's face on it. Real Which big. was, quote unquote, in the private collection of Courtney Love. Yeah. <laughs> hey, be- before <laughs> we, cheek. I don't want to get uh, run out of time on this. Uh, but how do we find search for him? Uh, you know, on the internet or whatever. To uh, so people that are listening to this would want to see what's going on. Right sure. Away. Yeah, um, on Facebook is an easy way because I update a lot of the projects that I'm doing. It's 25th and Lincoln Mural Company. Uh, 25th and Lincoln was the intersection that I grew up in Maslin um, as a kid. So um, no matter where this company goes, I wanted to make sure that I kept that history. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know it's kind of a mouthful of a name, but that's where that comes from. Uh, so my Facebook page, um, 25thandlincoln.com is my website. That really just kind of directs people to the social media accounts. Um, also, 25th underscore Lincoln underscore murals is on Instagram. That I'm posting on all the time. That just, you know, I'm out on a job and I'm posting a picture. Mm-hmm. So. so going back to the dots, maybe, you know, when I first saw you exhibit your work, there was an underground art scene in Maslin that had a lot of artists who were like-minded in that they were attracted to more underground content, maybe had a propensity for representing the macabre, but also Mm -hmm. more um, urban and alternative environments and subject matter. And um, so it, it was... It was really during that time, I don't know, 2008, 2009, that I think then the quote unquote dot started to emerge. And there was an exhibition at the Maslin Museum where this furniture was your first foray into application on that medium. It was called Stark Naked Salon. And the dresser that you talked about was unlike anything I'd ever seen before, because not only did he have to manipulate an image and transition it to representation in that sort of faux screen print um, style, but had to navigate around three dimensions, right? Like right. around drawers and the knobs, drawer knobs. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. So maybe you could talk a little bit about what that was like, and then the process by which you, over time, worked to tighten those yeah. up before you got to the very large scale canvas which are the walls that people can see publicly yeah Yeah. uh yeah so i don't know i think i just wanted to push myself out of the normal media of how people work 
I think one thing, too, is being young and not having a lot of money. You look for ways to create that is cheap and easy, and furniture on the side of the road was one of those. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. That was also the reason that I went transition to old wood instead of canvas because, you know, you can find that at the side of the road. Um, I like the aesthetic of that, you know, that, you know, that old apocalyptic uh, industrial feeling that some things have. And I think that's why I'm drawn to certain places in the world. But um, yeah, I mean, I think out of college, I was finding myself, you know, I, I love high contrast. I love bright pink. I love gritty and dirty. Um, and I was just experimenting. I was trained as a screen printer in at Kent State University. Um, so Really, the taking screen printing and putting it on something else came from how do I screen print on a wall? How do I screen print on a piece of furniture? Well, I could do it by hand. I mean, that's kind of crazy, but I'm also kind of crazy. So <laughs> um, some of my OCD really plays into that. And I think then that calls back to what you had mentioned of how that, how that design gets tighter and tighter. I think that's the OCD and that's just the, you know, being obsessive and just thinking how far can I push this until someone can't see that someone hand painted this or or they think this is such an investment. Why would someone do this? So it's almost that performance is where I start to find my true performance. That's great. Performance of the art is right there. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, you mentioned gritty, you mentioned the dust jar. I remember when I first got, was getting to know you, uh, God, 10, 12 years ago. You had just gotten back from uh, Detroit, and uh, and you were showing me pictures of these uh, art installations you were doing in abandoned factories. And oh yeah, just tell me, I mean, <laughs> that was as fascinating as hell, you know? Yeah, it was fun. Uh, you know, back in the early two thousands, and then up till you know, I was going there pretty much every weekend till the two thousand tens and teens and that sort of thing, and. Um, and there were a lot of abandoned factories, and oh, they probably gosh, still yeah. are in Detroit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Packard, they're still – every so often I get a update on my phone that says they're tearing it down, and then they don't. And I think the city's actually mm-hmm. tearing parts of it down now. But um, I, I'm just drawn to that history, so I think that's part of it. As a museum worker, you know, I, I love that. I love seeing what came before, the, just the – Albert Kahn's just the engineering prowess that goes into some of those buildings. But – Seeing them so neglected and, you know, not to get too political, but the fact that we were such a driving force in industry and then yeah. that's just sitting vacant. It's just, vacant. it's, 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 it's almost, it's a backwards way of saying it, but I was almost like, it's uh, like a crusade to those places that I, that I think. Homage. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm paying homage. I want to be part of that. I want to see what was, uh, where that history was. And Detroit's a beautiful place. Uh, Detroit has a immense art scene, incredible artists. Uh, Pat Perry is one of my favorite artists in, in Detroit. He's a mural painter as well. I really look up to him and just incredible artists in that city. Oh, I remember one of the pictures from, from the, that one of the installations was a, you know, a huge room, you know, it looked like a uh, last factory worker just laid down his tools and walked home. And there's this 1950s TV set oh, yeah. in a corner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we used to, oh, yeah, we used to roll TVs in and then like paste on the TVs and, you know, do big roller tags. And it was, it, it's, I think that freedom also, it's like, you know, I was working on who I was as a person and that freedom of medium, but then also just freedom to go and create and these places that were so neglected. It's just finding joy in that was kind of nice. Well, and I love that you've parlayed your love of and appreciation and respect for those spaces into the, the fact that your current studio space Oh. is in a retrofitted former Goodrich oh, yeah. plant yeah. in downtown Akron. So can you talk a little bit about what it's like to work in that space and with your your studio mate, John Communal, another Akron artist? Oh, he's great talent, that guy. Oh, I love him. It's hanging out with John when I'm there is just great. I love um, everything I've learned from him. He's a sculptor, a metal sculptor. Metal. Um, so about as far as you can get away from a mural painter or screen printer. Um, he was very happy when I first started writing the room because he's like, I'm getting old. I need someone that's quiet. And I'm like, well, besides my loud music, I'm pretty quiet, John. <laughs> um, but it's been amazing. That industrial space, um, we're up on the top floor um, of that complex across the street from Gojo, so that old BF Goodrich. Um, I love it. It's just an open industrial space, and that's exactly what I need. Mm-hmm. Um, thousands of square feet, um, just that freedom of painting, however small or large that I want to, and just not worrying about cleaning up 
you know, after myself completely. <laughs> you know, I'm respectful of John's space. So I always try to put his tools back where they go. But um, it's just embracing, I think, that old industry. I love it. I mean, mm-hmm. that is, I, I tell Sandy all the time, that is my favorite thing that I've done in the last couple decades is, is getting that studio space. Mm-hmm. It seems like Akron would have a lot of potential for these kinds of projects. I mean, just, you know, throughout all the old buildings that could be repurposed or even just repurposed as artwork in a way, right? Oh, yeah. absolutely. Mm-hmm. I agree with that 100%. Needless to say, you know, the adjacent parking lot to that structure that's just old walls everywhere, all yeah. of them could be painted. <laughs> right. I mean, I hate to go back to, to Detroit, but, the um, you know, murals in the marketplace, um, public things like that that they have where just every wall gets painted. I love that. I think that there's so much opportunity, um, but obviously at the same time, I'm very... Uh, in the corner of artists and artists should be paid how how they need to be paid. Sure. Um, so I know that's an investment on the community, mm-hmm. but I think that that is a return on investment when you get a space that people want to go to um, and be active in. Um, and I think that you know BF Goodrich would be an awesome opportunity. Um, to have another community public space. You know, I, I know that there's a lot of emphasis on new housing when it comes to those industrial spaces, yeah. but I, I like. Being honest, I like seeing those as art studios. I like being, you know, those being kept as industrial spaces. Mm-hmm. I don't want them to go around and clean up all of those spaces. Plus, I don't want them to go anywhere near my space. <laughs> <laughs> well, Leave my space alone. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, I love, too, that you mentioned the importance of investing in art because um, restaurants, for example, like Crave, mm-hmm. they commissioned John coming oh, out absolutely. to create a lot of the... Oh. The lighting, yeah, the bar. Support I mean, the he's bar. got all these. Oh, it's amazing! Mm-hmm. It's so beautiful. It's beautiful. So that's a great way to celebrate, to invest in our local talent, keep it local, and create a unique aesthetic. And then a stone's throw from that is, of course, your mural on the side of the Civic Building that overlooks right. the Lock Three space, and then pays tribute historically to the history of the canal mm-hmm. and our community. And now there's that great rubber worker. Mm-hmm memorial statue Mm -hmm. that's just a few blocks down still from there so Mm -hmm. i think it's really wonderful that businesses when they in communities when they invest in public art it establishes a sense of pride in community as well as teaches history um another really fun commission you received and you and your wife both worked on were the murals inside arche brewery which are also in retrofitted Goodrich yep. sites, right? So yep. right across from your studio. Yep. Yeah. Same same adjacent building. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Ron's an amazing guy. And, you know, I, I know things have been difficult for Arche and I hope everything goes well for him because he is such a supporter of local artists. Um, if you walk into the Canal Place location, um, there are so many awesome artists represented all over the walls. Um, and he's been so good to Sandy and I, so good to so many other people. Um, it's just awesome and yeah it makes me proud those people in the community that really support and they put their money where their mouth is and they realize that you know artists and what artists do you know those are just important um as any other contracting service you know what i mean that that's you know i make my livelihood off of this and you know i support our community i go to rubber ducks games all the time i love akron this is from akron and beyond i am bob ethington with my co-host nick nicholas and uh on this episode we're talking public art and uh its relationship with the city of akron and hearing from uh, a couple of artists and hearing how they go about their work and what a lot of the there's just the whole process is and the kind of uh inspirations behind that we have as our guest alex nicholas coon she's the executive director of the masculine museum and Scott Phillips, who's the operations officer at the Massillon Museum as well. So welcome back, folks. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's great to, I mean, I thought I knew so much about you, but I'm learning so much more. <laughs> well, thank you, Nick. I appreciate that. <laughs> and, you know, I have to say that, you know, the the band, the Bizarros I was in, we were honored uh, to play the first wedding that the Bizarros ever did was Scott and Sandy's wedding. Oh, really? Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> I mean, at the was, Maslin Museum. At the, at the Maslin, Maslin Museum. Yeah. yeah, I know. I loved it. I was so excited. I was I was fanboying like the whole night. I mean, I was supposed to be 
really excited about getting married. <laughs> 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 but I was really excited about the bizarros are going to play. I mean, so. that's a, that was a, <laughs> we're honored to do that, you know. And the the, the you know we shared a lot of musical experiences over the year years but the most recent one we're at blossom going to, going to see uh, the cure you know it was one of those rainy thunderous days where they they even shut down the concert for over an hour you know because of the lightning you know people mm-hmm. the, they wanted the people electrocuted out on the lawn but anyway there are like thousands of umbrellas but you know they confiscated one umbrella that night and it, and it was scott's i mean i mean <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. It yeah. was a, it was a crazy. You had night. A, everybody had these umbrellas, and you had one that was like a, a weapon. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think the reasoning it and was it, a Maslin Museum umbrella yeah, oh, as well. Yeah, it was, yeah. That, it was really sad Centric. because that one is out of print and. Yeah, it was an old, it was actually <laughs> since I was an intern I had that umbrella. So I was I think I, I think it was the most sad. mad that it was a sentimental umbrella. <laughs> but I guess that what they said is in you know I, no offense to any of the workers because I know they're just handing down the rules. Um, but I guess that it's considered a golf umbrella, which I didn't know was a thing where it has like a, a point on the oh, end. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. right. But um, needless to say, once I was in uh, the venue, I saw a whole bunch of people with uh, the same umbrella. But it's Scott okay. Looks- for listeners who don't know what Scott looks like, he looks pretty scary. But yeah, <laughs> I'm a very big guy. I'm about so. six five, <laughs> two hundred and fifty pounds. Yeah. Actually, the opposite. But um, so they took my umbrella, and I was kind of mad about it because I knew that it was going to storm, it was going to rain. Um, and they were like, "Well, you can pick it up after the concert. Just come to this kiosk afterwards." And of course, it poured. I'm yeah. soaking wet. I was yeah. shivering the yeah. entire concert, but it was incredible. Robert Smith. It was the oh, good show. Man. Oh, absolutely. It's a great show. I I've seen the Cure a handful of times, but I think that that was probably my favorite performance. Um, but uh, they were never there when I went to pick up my Massa Museum umbrella. Oh, afterwards. shocking! It nope. was like were, it was like the gone. Walking Dead on the way out. It, yeah, I've never it seen people moving so <laughs> slowly in yeah. concert with one another toward the doors and it was all misty and the rain mm-hmm. had stopped and it was just it was zombie bizarre. land yeah <laughs> oh, it yeah. was so speaking of akron and music roots uh scott and nick and i all share an interesting history and in that we all lived at one point or another in the same house in Ellet, part of Akron, in right across from the former Goodyear blimp hangar. And um, it was really cool watching the Scots during his transition to Akron, the growth of his love of community and love of Akron, because having known him now for, I don't know, maybe 15 years, Ever so, how long have you been at the museum? Um, I started 15? as an intern in 2007, and then I was hired in at 2008, 2009, okay. something in that ballpark. Long time. So yeah, a long time. It's been a while. Um, and seeing his passion for instilling a sense of a deeper appreciation for art in downtown Massillon and creating murals that reflect Massillon's heritage in its football team, mm-hmm. the legacy of Paul Brown. Former, formerly, you had murals of Lillian Gish, the silent film actress who has a connection to Maslin, and then Tommy Henrik, who was from Maslin, played for the New York Yankees. Seeing you transition your work and how you help, you know, retain that sense of pride and instill in new generations a sense of pride in their history to that of Akron. It's been just so cool. And because um, that same house I referenced is also the birthplace of clone records. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just neat. And, and Dad, I don't know if you know this, but um, there were when Scott dismantled parts of the the wooden veneer and and helped um, replace other parts of, you know, the wood in the house as you were getting ready to sell it. He was able to reclaim some of that mm. as a substrate for some work he created. Beautiful. Really. And he even um, he even salvaged some of that great yellow wallpaper oh. with like the Florida de lis and framed a piece of it for me, which I have um, in my office. So he really, it was just also um, 
you know, really cool that he occupied space that was at one point in time the headquarters and the birthplace of Clone Records, just bringing it back to the Akron music history. Yeah. My mother wallpapered that, and she never did that wallpaper in her life. <laughs> Really? It was a project. Yeah, she just, hey, I'm going to do this, and she did it. She did a pretty good job. I mean, she that did. lasted. It yeah. did. It came down pretty easy when Mary and I took it down in the kitchen, but it never peeled or anything yeah, like that. She was in her 80s? When no. She, yeah. When she, she put the wallpaper up? It had no. to have been because she passed away at 91. So, no. She put that. 70s. That's been there ever since I was alive. Well, anyways, anyway. <laughs> you can choose whether or not to edit that out yeah, in yeah, the yeah, podcast conversation out, or keep it in for. You know, Posterity, what did you say? Tender, yes. tender moments between father and daughter <laughs> <laughs> arguing about history and timeline. I thought you were going to say, Alex, that when they, uh, when you tore the the walls down that you found all this contraband. <laughs> oh my gosh. Weapons did, and, uh, you know. I did find a handful of boxes of old sealed records from, from oh, okay. the 80s, a Nix uh, of Bizarro's records, and I actually called him and I yeah. said, hey, I found all these records. You should get them out from under the Staircase. Uh, stairs. I was like, can I have some? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I thought I got all everything out, but he found like a couple hundred Bowling Balls Volume 2. Oh my yeah. gosh. <laughs> I love it. Um, going back to that, the fact that these public art installations they really, really establish um, a sense of something special about a community. You know, you've done that in Kent with the Joe Walsh mural. Um, by the way, Joe Walsh was the honorary PhD recipient the year I graduated from oh, Kent. Oh, I was there, So yeah. he was at our graduation, yeah, remember? Mm-hmm. And um, in downtown Canton, there's the Greatest Rivalry mural that acknowledges the tradition between the Canton McKinley Bulldogs and the Massillon Tigers. We talked about the Maslin and Akron ones already. I think it's important for you to share with the listeners the long time conversation we and other of your peers have had about making the distinction between a mural and a banner. Yeah. Because um, so often there's a misnomer associated with certain representations of artwork that's placed on walls but can you make that distinction because i think it's important for everyone to be equipped with the right vocabulary yeah yeah i really appreciate you given the 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 opportunity to because i know that i get very passionate when that happens um traditionally a mural as far as a painted um work on a exterior wall is what i would consider a mural obviously there's you know frescoes all that sort of stuff but the actual creation of something on that substrate um, is really kind of what I'm talking about because there has been a modern, you know, um, process as far as vinyl attached to a wall. Um, you know, it's obviously designed. Um, an artist can do a piece of work and then it's put onto vinyl and then attached to the wall, which makes it obviously way easier, way more cost effective. Um, banners, you know, with grommets, that sort of thing. Um, but from my standpoint, and I know that everyone has their own opinions, but I'm I'm pretty um, particular in the fact that you know I those are obviously pieces of art and pieces of public art, but I would hesitate to call those murals. Um, I really like the more traditional sense of if if I'm calling something a mural, I was up on a lift and I was actually placing that you know by hand on that wall, um, and I think that when it is kind of a misnomer and used in that way. Um, as far as a mural and it's a banner, it just, I kind of think it, it, it takes some of that power away from the artist. It discredits the the integrity and intention and all the labor yeah. that went into actually painting mm-hmm. something. Right. Yeah, I think right. the Civic took, I, I, I'm not sure if I went and did a final count, 250, 300 hours, work hours to Whoa. do that wall. And it's only 19 by 20. Wow. So, I mean, those, all those halftone dots are painted by hand, so... And can you also tell the listeners a bit about the type of paint you use? Because some people might hear mural or wall or painted mural, and they might just make the assumption that they're spray paint. But can you talk a little bit about and talk a little bit about your process? Because it is, as Scott mentioned, very tedious, but that does reflect the aesthetic that he goes for, but also the quality and the... um, meticulous nature of the work that he forces himself <laughs> yeah. uh, to do. So you could talk a little bit about, 
you know, not to give away any of your trade secrets, but oh, no, anyone seeing, watching you in process, which you're very also transparent about your process. I mean, it is out there. It's public, but... Yeah, I have no qualm telling people exactly what I do and how I do it because, once again, I think people hesitate to take that upon themselves because it's so much labor. Um, but yeah, as, as meticulous as I am about designs, I'm just as meticulous about process um, and uh, materials. Um, I am a big Sherwin-Williams fan. Um, I don't have a, a sponsorship, but I will gladly take one <laughs> if uh, they hear this. Um, I love Sherwin-Williams. They've been very good to me, um, but their products are amazing. I, I know they charge Another a lot. Another Northeast Ohio company, so that's Absolutely. great keeping it local. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it, you know, their products aren't inexpensive, but they're worth it. I mean, I will never paint with anything besides Sherwin-Williams paint if I have a choice. Um, I use Shercrill predominantly, which is an, a marine-grade industrial paint, and I've had representatives um, from the corporate office even say they've never seen that paint used for what I use it for, mm -hmm. but it's a perfect application as far as how long it lasts, what it does, that sort of thing. Uh, Shercrill Premixed Black is my favorite paint in the world. <laughs> I have never painted with a black that goes on with one coat before, and that stuff does. Um, maybe the sales of Premixed Black is going to go up as well after <laughs> this. But... Um, yeah, I, I, I love Sharon Williams. I'm obviously very um, particular on, you know, my process as far as how that goes. It's funny. There's a, a local company called Tomarios, and uh, I don't know if they're still considered that, but at one point they were the largest uh, – users of uh, Sherman Williams in the world. They go, oh, wow. They, they painted like these huge bridges around the world. And, oh, that's mm. awesome. Yeah. Yeah, the, the product's unmatched, I think. I mean... So I have a question. Um, when you're doing a large-scale mural, do you have help? Yes, most of the time. I've gotten myself now to the point where um, I have my team of workers. A lot of times Sandy will help, but uh, Aaron Meyer and Joshua Hum, um, they're incredible. Um, they helped with the Civic, which is why we were able to get it done in about a month. Because um, when we did Timey Henrik, which was, <laughs> gosh, when was that? 2012, 2013. Which time? Yeah, we did it twice. There was a <laughs> problem with the contractor that put the top coat on. So mm -hmm. nothing with me, but that was just a whole headache. Mm -hmm. Um but uh it took a whole a what that year? took about that 2010 no that was uh, that project took about three months and no then but it, took, it was oh you were asking what year i think it was yeah. 2010 yeah maybe 2010 i know it's hard it's so hard to remember years now after the <laughs> pandemic um but yeah um so i do have a team of people now because mm -hmm. that it does it is pretty difficult to do that amount of work that amount of labor and just make it a relative timeline that finishes a, a project sure. within yeah, a, yeah it makes sense you know, well when alex mentioned that she had done some painting of some of your dots, it just kind of registered to me because I was thinking like, well, sure, projects of that, uh, that, of that size mm -hmm. and, and scope, um, you almost, you know, I mean, you're obviously doing all of the art, so to speak, all of the, all of the design or however, whatever the right phrase mm -hmm. for that would be. But, um, Sure, people helping you actualize that. Oh, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And I, there's so many talented artists around here, it's easy to find those people. Mm -hmm. But you were really um, gracious in allowing the community to get involved in the Henrik mural because certain sections, and we knew that it had a, a, you know, a dedication date that was projected. Mm -hmm. And so in an effort to get that done, you know, enlisting the help of people for the sections that didn't require you go up on a ladder or the lift, you know, mm -hmm. I can remember the the portions I showed up to help paint were at the very bottom where I could sort of like lay on the ground, you know. And you would work day and night. You'd use some vacation days at the museum. You'd use all of your weekends. But many times you'd be at the museum, you know, sort of nine to five. And then you'd work well into the evening and had to also make sure that the proper lighting was there. And I can remember many nights driving by and seeing someone working there late at night on this mural, you know, to get it done because it was how many feet? Uh, that one's 18 feet high by 63 feet wide. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a monster. It, it occupies the whole side of the Elam Music building mm -hmm. um, on Tommy Hendrick Boulevard in yep. Maslin, which is right off of Lincoln Way. And so Mandy, I think, paid it a, a part of it. I think a lot of then Maslin Museum staff members were enlisted to help. And so it felt like the community really had ownership 
mm-hmm. as well. So you were very gracious to allow us into that that process. You're yeah. smirking. I'm not sure why. I was just it was just making me think because there was a family that actually walked by when we were not finishing up, but I think we had two or three more days on the Civic. Um, and there was a young girl, and she was so excited that she was seeing someone paint a mural, and Aww. like the person was there. Uh-huh. So I believe it was Josh and Aaron and I. I think we all, all all were there that afternoon, and she was like, "Oh my gosh, this is so amazing!" Oh, I you was mean like, at the Akron Civic Project? Mm-hmm, Akron Civic. Um, and I said, "Do you want to paint a dot?" And she was so Aww. excited, <laughs> and I was just to see that made me excited. That was one of my favorite memories of that project. It's just she was like. I'm going to walk back here and I'm going to see this dot and I'm going to know that I painted that. Oh my I'm like, God. that's so cool. Those dots go on in pencil. No. Yeah, right? those are all drawn in pencil and then painted. So it's 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 designed once, it's drawn, and then it's painted. So it's, it's yeah, it's a labor of love for sure. I'm quite the masochist. Uh, yeah, many times revisiting that same dot, right, from its design to its transfer onto a different material so that it can then be transferred via pencil and then and then painted it's yeah, it's really incredible halftone's pretty involved in people that know halftone and know like making halftone look pretty you know you have to really get down in the 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 minute dis- details with a wacom pen while, while you're designing and everything's cleaned up and yeah so it's it's a labor of love for thank sure. you for mentioning mentioning halftone i think that's the first time we've mentioned it on this episode and i i should have done that and i just referred to it lazily as dots but um <laughs> yeah halftone you know, is the proper proper term but i'm cool with dots too so (laughs) and maybe you could tell people as well what they're used to seeing this represented in like um starting back with newspapers yeah right? actually you know uh if you think of halftone it's just one color so if you think of it as black it would be when you see a newspaper and it's all those dots and the dots are printed so you know, tiny, um, depending on the size of the dot, how big it is, and how close it is to other dots, will give the illusion a grayscale. So, newspaper printing, um, a lot of people in pop culture know Andy Warhol's work, which those are screen prints that has all those dots. Um, so, right. I Where like Lichtenstein that. Where Lichtenstein worked with in that mm-hmm. uh, yep. as well, you know, sort of playing on that. Yeah, so I like that aesthetic. So my big thing was how do I take that aesthetic and put it on things that don't normal? You know, I can't take a sc- uh, screen and print on the side of a building and make it last, but right. I can do it by hand. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it would be interesting if down the road that girl that painted that one dot, you know, <laughs> bills you $1.99. Yeah, <laughs> I'll pay her. I'll pay her. That's one thing, too, that everyone that helps gets paid. I'm I'm big on that. I, I want it to be fair, too. Mm-hmm. No one's making out better than other people. I want this to be something that everyone can get excited about. Scott's always been really democratic and equ- equitable in his, his process. And, you know, I think the fact that um, not only the sense of pride that I've mentioned is really important for a community, but the aesthetic investment in the landscape. You know, Scott and I many years ago attended a museum conference in Baltimore, Maryland, and um, he had brought to my attention there was a mural walk. There's an app you could download on your phone, Mm -hmm. and it took you on a walking tour of all the murals in Baltimore. And he and our friend and fellow colleague at the time, Jill, and I spent hours on this tour, and we discovered... Parts of Baltimore um, during the day that um, we might not otherwise ever have entered. But via this tour, it took us on a beautiful, beautiful walk. And we had the most amazing day. And you see various styles represented, various media. You know, there's spray paint. There were, um, you know, maybe there's some Sharon Williams on the walls, but lots of different styles, lots of media. And. The community invested, you know, building owners, the city, you know, so private and public dollars went into making this possible. And it's a real hallmark of the public art scene in in Baltimore. And it's just such an important, um, you know, buildings may fall. And Scott has sadly seen some of the the walls on which his um, hours of, of hard work and painting have come down. And that's also really sad. So, you know, nothing is permanent, really. But, um, you know, it's at least for the time that they last or the building owners support the idea and the city supports it, that this this beauty can be bestowed upon the landscape. And especially in places like Baltimore and Detroit Mm -hmm. in our 
communities. You know, I know that it's like a, a term that a lot of people are trying to replace, you know, but the quote unquote rust belt, a lot of these previous industrial meccas, it's bringing another sense of life to oftentimes, you know, abandoned or um, uh, I don't know, you know, in the process of being repurposed areas. So it's a really special thing. Public art has a, a really important function in terms of quality of life and appreciation of a space. I think that the uh, to go back to what you were talking about uh, being equitable with the other people that are helping with your work, the other artists that are helping. Um, that strikes me as being a terrific thing on your part, and not necessarily a common thing, or at least, <laughs> or certainly. Over the years, there's been a lot of people who have claimed, I'm not saying locally, but just, mm -hmm. you know, worldwide that, oh, this guy, you know, or this woman came up with this idea, but then we ended up changing it and we ended up, you know, mm -hmm. adding, doing all this work and they get no credit. Right. right. Yeah. 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 No, that's always been a big priority of mine. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say that was prioritized just as much as, you know, the work itself is making sure that when the project's done, mm -hmm. you know, building owner, whoever contracts us is just as happy as, you know, the workers. And that includes myself and my assistants. Yeah. I think that, um, I mean, this is kind of touching upon this whole conversation, uh, but everyone has been saying, but um, these kind of art projects, public art, it can really be part of the reinvention of a of a community mm -hmm. or of a city. And uh, I lived in Detroit years ago uh, for a number of years, and um, the reinvention of Detroit is unbelievable because I went went to see Leonard Cohen play mm. and oh. uh, at the Fox Theater, which is unbelievably gorgeous, right. most beautiful theater I've ever seen. But the thing that was so strange, and this is a dozen years ago, I'm guessing, um, the thing that was so weird about Detroit was that you could tell that there had been enormous wealth there. Mm -hmm. And oh, there yeah. were these pockets of just beautiful buildings, the mm -hmm. ballpark, for the, where the Tigers play, the Fox Theater, which mm -hmm. is opulent. I mean, it's unbelievable. Um, and, and restaurants and stuff. But they were all, at this point, packed into roughly four or five blocks. And it's you still didn't that need, way. And you didn't need to go very far away from that to be kind of like... Scared. Sc well, yeah. frankly, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I remember mm -hmm. distinct... My one memory of this is we went by... My friend and I, we went by this bar... And it was like the bar had no windows. Everything was barred, barred on it, and, but it was open. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't know how much you'd pay me to go into that place. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. it, was, it just seemed like a creepy place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. But, you know, beyond that is all the places that have been uh, torn down, repurposed, mm -hmm. uh, from everything to art to uh, farms. Right. Yeah, I I think it's amazing that it's it's I think it's a dynamic thing. We have to remember that that it's not just the public art mm -hmm. that brings those places back. Um, I think using pla uh, using these locations for multi purposes is very smart, and I think Detroit does that in a great way. And mm -hmm. I see a lot of that uh, possibility in Akron, and I'm just really happy to be a part of you know that in a little way and do what I do to try to make um, you know public art better down here yeah. and i think too it's just like representing that tradition and that history in a cool contemporary way because i mm -hmm. think that's a big part of it too is like mm -hmm. you have to make that relative to now you know some people might all oh, boring you know guy holding a tire you know there's a canal photo again <laughs> ah. but there's something cool about it i mean there's mm -hmm. something mythic about that guy holding that tire i mean that was the history of our community and i think it's only going to benefit us if we put that out there even more, if we highlight all the history of Akron, mm -hmm. you know, and not just canal history, not just tire workers, all, every, you know, every group of people that live here in Akron, I think that we all need to be represented in public art. Right. I don't know right. if you've seen uh, Ryan Humbert's uh, design, uh, our logo here from, from Akron and Beyond with a blimp. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. pretty, pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, well, that I is think, cool. Yeah, like I, I think Akron and Detroit are both doing that really well, engaging, like you said, Scott, other um, industries, whether it's Rubber City Clothing Company or it's 
what the radio station here is doing or, um, you know, uh, local um, fundraisers to erect this sculpture that you referenced. Um, It takes everybody and younger generations to help reinterpret that history and make sure, as you said, underrepresented histories can um, have light shed Absolutely. on them as well. So right, right. new stories being made all the time and there are still so many stories that aren't told. Right. Well, um, we often say in the show that Akron as a city and a community, it, it just seems to maintain, you know, somehow it, it, it's uh, still remained uh, a vital place where a lot of other similar cities and demographics around the, the Midwest have not done so well. They've really fallen apart. Um, We've always I, had good leadership and mm-hmm. people coming up with great ideas and, yeah. and enough community support to, to get them off the ground. And you know, Yeah, but to, to both Scott and Alex's point, I think that um, there probably is sort of a philosophical debate or battle or whatever about um, – Really, like, you know, do you, I mean, do you do this reinvention like Detroit did, or do you try, because you were talking about how, well, yeah, but Akron wants to put up a lot of new houses, or they want Mm -hmm. to put up a lot of, you know, a a mall somewhere, or whatever, and it's like, um, or retail, I should say, at this point, but uh, uh, I think that's a real debate, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, because it's two different approaches, Right, to well, how you keep the city yeah. vital and vibrant. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's what someone's interpretation of what, what progress should be. It is, yeah. right. but there's also a formula that, economic formula that, that shows that the more people you can have residing in an area, the more prosperity you can bring to that area. So whether it's through repurposing buildings for housing or building new housing, housing in downtown areas helps create people who help pay property tax, who populate places. And, you know, it's really part of the the key. And um, and so there is a philosophical debate, you know, about gentrification right. versus, um, you know, um, utilizing, repurposing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there's a, it's a, it's a really, um, careful balance that has to be established but it requires the buy-in of everybody like you said dad the the community also local government you know you need the leadership and then you need the the money (laughs) you need the investors um whether they're investing in public art or you know um the city landscape and format itself so akron has been fortunate that it's had a healthy mix of those um maslin on a much smaller scale does downtown Canton and in Detroit Mm -hmm. Um, so it takes the ingenuity and it takes the people who are willing to live downtown and who want to live downtown um, as well as on the outskirts of these communities to make it work right so this is from Akron and beyond I'm Bob Ethington with my co-host Nick Nicholas and we're getting a little short on time here so before we end uh, I wanted to ask you Alex I'm assuming you do art yourself Photo, photos. So tell I'm, us about your creative endeavors a bit. Well, um, I... I know you're a hotshot now, an executive director <laughs> and all that. And really don't have time She's for this She's the Warhol. Stuff. Now she tells us in the factory what oh to make. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I knew her when she was in diapers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how funny. Um, I am not... I don't proclaim to be an artist. I'm an amateur photographer, and an, I'm an admirer of artists and and art and i'm so privileged to be in the company today with all of you as artists you know who are musicians and and um visual artists and then i get to work at a museum and and be in such close proximity to other artists so Mm -hmm. i'm an amateur photographer the best i do love photography but um i guess my creative energy is focused on helping connect artists to spaces and mm-hmm. and people to one another. Right. Um, I can't take credit for Scott and Sandy, um, who are married, 
um, having met at the Maslin Museum. I can't really take credit for, you know, being that sort of matchmaker, but um, sounds like it you does are. make my yeah, heart happy. No. <laughs> no, it just makes it makes me happy um, to be, you know, enmeshed in a creative space and get to have opportunities like this to talk to you all. But um, no, I just I've just always loved being around art and having had a father who appreciated art and was a musician, is a musician, um, you know, it helped expose me to a lot of great things and I just feel really fortunate. Remember when you were a little over two years old, I, you were singing Big Sister's Clothes by Elvis Costello. <laughs> <laughs> and in no time it was the Pixies and <laughs> You did you you did right. Velvet Underground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You um those Sunday all day um record fests that you had, you know, Sunday in our house was always reserved. It was not football. I didn't know what football was <laughs> for a really long time. I didn't, Nick I, doesn't either. Not until I met Bob, no, he yeah. doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> um and you know in working in Maslin and my um my life now being, you know, so f in, within Stark County, that sounds like sacrilegious. But um, no, Sundays consisted of um, dad running through his vinyl collection, you know, playing a record in its entirety. Us not being allowed to touch, of course, the the record player or the well the done. vinyl. <laughs> we couldn't even so much breathe on it, but he would show us the album art, you know, front and back. Um, and then... After literally a full day of that, it was time for, um, what, Star Trek and then The Simpsons. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and, and then we, bed. Comparing our family to The Simpsons, you know? And then comparing our family <laughs> yeah, yeah. to The Simpsons. Yeah, so um, that was a full day. I mean, and and that's where I learned of, you know, his, his musical taste rubbed off, I think, pretty exclusively on me. Mm -hmm. I don't know that there was anything that I... I didn't like or don't love now. We saw Bob Dylan played. last week. We did. We did. We've seen Bob Dylan. We've seen so many of the, Pixies. you know, love. Oh, yeah. Um, we've got uh, so many, um, yeah, so much of my musical taste. And it just, it's great that I get to work in a place too where a lot of my colleagues, like Scott, we have similar taste in, in music. So, you know, we can extend our, the love of what we do at the Maslin Museum and of art in general to, mm -hmm. you know, sure. concert venues, which is sure. cool. I can commiserate with your um, LP issue with the kids touching. <laughs> oh, now my, yeah. my twins like to run over to my record cabin and just pull them off. Oh, yeah. So I'm like, you know, those are the expensive ones. You know what you have to do? <laughs> what I did was I had um, I bought one of those really cheap record players I kept in their room so that they you know, develop a sense of appreciation for vinyl. Um, but then if they break it, it's not a, yeah. a big deal. So they just they broke the cheap record player um, That's a good idea. just last week. Mm. So. You know, but case in point, yeah, don't let them anywhere near the good stuff. <laughs> well, I have this, I'll tell you a very quick story. I, when I first started dating the the woman who would be my wife, uh, for You didn't let her touch the records either? Well, I oh, went, I went <laughs> over, well, you're getting warm. Uh -oh. <laughs> I uh, went over uh, to her place and she wanted, and I brought some records over and she, uh, I had a Steely Dan's album, Katie Lied, and she wanted to borrow it. And I'm like, Sure. <laughs> and so, uh, which I normally did not do for anyone, but obviously I was falling for her. So I, <laughs> I loaned it, I loaned it to her and left. And then like a week later or so I came back and I'm sitting in her place and I look down on a coffee table and there is the record oh, out no. of the sleeve oh, no. just laying on the table. No, no. And then I see off on the side, the cover and the cover's got like a rip in it. Oh, ah. and, I, and I remember think, thinking at the time, I must really be falling in love with her because there's no way I would have any kind of relationship with anyone that would oh do gosh. this. Oh, wow. <laughs> and as you can tell, I remember to this day. This is like 50 years ago. Oh, my gosh. I still have dad used to buy us for Valentine's Day, Christmas birthdays, Easter, our, our Easter baskets even. I'd always receive a record. Um and I still have each and every one of those mm -hmm. from the, um, I hope I don't embarrass you from, you know, the Jets Christmas album, everything from that like popular music to um, Alvin and the Chipmunks, you know, Chipmunk Punk, which oh, is yeah. where I first heard of Blondie, not from your Sunday hmm. morning uh, listening sessions. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, I think, too, to a testament to the love of and appreciation of music you instilled in us. I have every single album that you've ever 
ever bought me. Um, and my brother and sister, I know that they didn't necessarily have oh. the same attachment. So I even tried to salvage whatever ones of theirs I could. <laughs> um, so my girls are now listening to and appreciating all well, of those. It's, that's it's, super it's, cool. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's great that it worked out for you this well, Alex. I mean, because as they hear <laughs> okay. you describe it, it sounds like a North Korean uh, indoctrination. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> 12 you know, hours, you're going to listen You know what? Music. It's funny that you say that because it rubbed <laughs> off a little bit on my brother in a positive way, right? It worked, the you know, like that... <laughs> indoctrination um and then my sister it didn't really stick at all no she's totally <laughs> in another planet of music she is which is okay we still yeah, love yeah, her yeah 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 but. yeah i'm hoping that our twins have good taste in music i have what i call the studio soundtrack playlist that i always play them in the car nice. when i'm oh. toting them back and forth so we'll see nice. how that goes yeah you gotta so. start them young like i yeah. said it worked on me yep. maybe yeah. but, but maybe yeah everyone's tolerance sort of wore off but i I, I didn't really have a choice. I was the oldest child. I didn't know we could rebel against Sunday <laughs> yeah, my, Sunday listening time. My parents and their heavy music, I was thought of as a little bit different because the first album that I bought when I was 10 was uh, Garbage's first album. Uh, and um, nice. my brothers and my parents all thought that was very light music mm -hmm. compared right. to the heavy music that they were all used <laughs> to, to listen music. to. Yes, it was. It was. It was a girl band. I'm like, heck <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay. Well, this has been From Akron and Beyond, and our guests have been Scott Phillips. He's operations officer at the Massillon Museum, and Alex Nicholas Kuhn, who is the executive director of the Massillon Museum. And uh, we really have enjoyed having both of you with us today. Hope you enjoyed it as well. And uh, so on that note, I'm Bob Ethington with my co-host Nick Nicholas. We will check in with you next time.